so many people have been speaking about the climate crisis. So many things have been put on paper. But the real question is why is it that we're still not acting at the scale and speed that is necessary? The extreme weather events that the scientists have long connected to the climate crisis are becoming far more frequent and far more destructive. 450 years, we built up a world based on the assumption that we can exploit the planet for free and it translates to very dramatic impacts happening right as we speak. The climate crisis is a threat multiplier, which means it exacerbates existing inequities in our society. The impacts are felt most deeply by black, indigenous, and communities of color. We're living through an explosion of inequality. We need to remember we're on the same planet, and this is the planet that we need to make sustainable for the whole of humanity. Climate change is impacting food security as well as political stability in many nations around the world. Five years ago, there were 80 million people marching towards starvation. That number jumped to 135 million. What caused the jump? It was man-made conflict, like in Ukraine, compounded with climate shocks. No one is as vulnerable to climate change as farmers are. If you talk transformation, the first thing they want to know is, what must I do on my farm? We know that this transition will require a fast adoption of a lot of new technologies. And the question today is how to find the appropriate way to finance this technology. To put a number around it, it's an extra two and a half to three trillion dollars a year of additional finance that we have to find in order to get those emissions down. Financial institutions have a lot of roles to play to bring the advice and provide the financing to make these transitions happen. Younger generations are demanding a sense of purpose. They want to look at companies and say, I am investing with you all for this reason. With the upcoming two COPs taking place in Africa and the Middle East, we have this tremendous opportunity to put emerging markets at the forefront of our collective response to climate change. For international trade has to be part of the solution. How do we all get together to talk about a global carbon price that can guide us and help us to decarbonize the world? The solutions are there. What we need is governments to regulate, to invest, and we need business to act with values. History will look at us, people, politicians, corporate leaders. These times requires not only solutions, but speed. There is nowhere else to look than the mirror. We are the ones that need to do this. Good morning from New York. Uh, this is the first happening at the World Economic Forum's meeting on sustainability taking place during the United Nations General Assembly week. And uh, it is quite natural for us to focus then on climate change. It is really no or never United Nations has strongly underlined in the run-up to this week. We have been focusing a lot on uh, why. I think now it is a time to really focus on how. But we are reminded every day that climate change is nothing that will happen for next generation or grandchildren or children. It is happening here and now and it can be felt. We saw yesterday the devastating uh, hurricane Fiona hitting Puerto Rico. And this is one of hundreds of examples that the cost of inaction far exceeds the cost of action. We have a great panel with us this morning. Uh, to really inaugurate our meeting, uh, starting with uh, Minister Rania al mashat Minister of International Cooperation of Egypt. We have Minister Villa Skinari, Minister for Development, Cooperation and Foreign Trade of Finland. We have the CEO of Yara, Sventura Hulsater, uh, one of the largest fertilizer companies in the world. And not at least, Andrew Stair, the CEO and president of Bezos Earth Fund, one of the largest funds when it comes to then enhancing um, fight against climate change, but also the broader nature-based uh, agenda. 
As we also know, uh, and as was also underlined in the presentation video, COP26 was in Glasgow, and we're now moving to Egypt for COP27 in November in Sharm Sheikh. And Egypt has uh, taken on a very proactive uh, agenda. And Minister, I think you even said that <coughs> no, we need to move from pledges <coughs> to implementation. And how are you going to make sure that that happens in this polarized world where uh, we see that less actors are really talking to each other? Uh, thank you very much, Borgi. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and as you mentioned, uh, absolutely. Uh, the climate agenda is of key priority for all countries um, and we're coming out uh, of uh, a double uh, crisis. We just had COVID with countries being affected in different ways and now there's the climate uh, issue as well. Uh, as we saw in the video that was uh, shown, uh, to address climate, it's everybody's role. All stakeholders have to be engaged. Governments have a role to play. Uh, the international community as financing has a role to play. Uh, philanthropy has a role to play. Um, and uh, citizens' awareness as well. When we say we want to go from pledges to implementation, one of the key highlights uh, that we saw out of Glasgow uh, were the many pledges. And for the first time, there were very strong pledges from the private sector. Uh, and the point is, how can we ensure that these pledges make their way on the ground in countries that need them the most? Uh, there is definitely um, uh, a financing divide. Uh, when we take a look at the landscape uh, of climate finance, uh, we find that it's very much skewed towards uh, the, developing, the developed world, whereas those that need it the most to be able to move forward are the developing countries. Uh, and that's why uh, what we have been trying to do over the past several months uh, is uh, pave the way to try and see how different countries can actually move into implementable projects, put on the, uh, in front of everyone projects that could be implemented so that this concept that countries are not ready with projects, uh, concept that uh, capital does not know where to go, um, and try to find innovative uh, financing tools. Philanthropy plays a very big role. Uh, multilateral development banks uh, play a very big role because of the de-risking factor that uh, can be provided uh, to the private sector. And uh, another very important aspect, uh, just linking to pledges to implementation, is the importance of food security. Uh, all of us saw that uh, with what's happening uh, in Europe, uh, food security is not just uh, a specific country's problem or a developing country's problem, it's a global problem. And that, that's why this COP is also uh, focusing on adaptation projects. So these are the two uh, points that are key for COP27. Uh, and both the G20 and COP27 are from the south, Indonesia, Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt, and again, uh, trying to uh, scale up the voices of developing countries and low-income countries. I, I guess that uh, walking the talk when it comes to the pledge from Copenhagen of 100 billion US dollars a year in climate financing uh, is going to be something crucial. It was already touched on, of course, and discussed at uh, COP26. Where do we really stand there? How, how big is the gap? Because some people say it's a gap of 13 uh, billion, and some say it's larger or smaller? Uh, data here is extremely important, and that's why uh, institutions such as the OECD come forward with you know, doing the accounting. All we know is that it's definitely short than the 100 billion. And we take a, when you take a look at the spread across uh, geographies, uh, Africa gets the least, even though it's most affected by climate, uh, and it contributes the least to the uh, uh, climate crisis. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, when we looked at Glasgow, Everybody was so ambitious beyond the 100 billion. We heard trillions, and we heard the trillions from different actors. So the point is, how can we make sure whether it's the billions or the trillions, how do they make the, their way to the projects on the ground? And that's why uh, the uh, Egyptian uh, presidency uh, hosted several roundtables in different regions uh, to basically uh, come up with a list of investable projects to be presented to those who have made the pledges and say, here are the projects, let's try together to see how we can start implementing them, including adaptation and food security projects. No, well, thank you. We'll come back to the adaptation. I just wanted to have a short follow-up on adaptation. Uh, Andrew Stair, we have talked a lot about mitigation, and now we're talking also adaptation. Is that showing that uh, we haven't succeeded in the mitigation uh, piece? Are you supportive of also now focusing more on adaptation? Oh, uh, yes, look, um, and by the way, Borgo, first of all, thank you for what you're doing at the World Economic Forum. We, we look forward to this event each year. It's become a real um, important event for us, so thank you very much. Um, 
yes, look, uh, uh, climate change is here, so we have no choice. We've got to fight both on the mitigation side and the adaptation side. And for too long, we have uh, been lulled into this sense that, or oh, maybe we could solve the problem. Therefore, we won't focus on adaptation. And if we focus on adaptation, that would be admitting we've failed. And that, of course, is not the case. So um, it is a disgrace uh, what's happening in the poor countries of the world. And it's a disgrace what is happening to poor people throughout the world. Uh, we all know that poor people have not caused the problem, um, but they're the ones that suffer most. And it's time we now put um, our resources, our political energy, our money um, where our mouths are. Well, thank you, Andrew, and thank you for your leadership on this. Let me now uh, go uh, to Minister villas Um We know that uh, in Europe, you're really now trying to square a circle because Europe has uh, big ambitions when it comes to the green transition, but no, Europe is also in the middle of a huge energy crisis. And how to manage the short-term energy security access problems without uh, losing the baby with the bathwater, meaning uh, the green transition? Well, first of all, thank you also from my side. It's good to be here in New York. Um, I think as a European minister and as a Nordic minister, first I want to emphasize that, yes, we have supply crisis in Europe, but at the same time we have, have done a lot for the green transition renewables, including nuclear in a country like Finland. So we have different portfolios, so there is no one Europe. Nordic countries have paved the way with the common electricity market. But you're absolutely right that, that instead of just looking the mirror that what Europe has done wrong, we really have to speed up and do it rapidly at the European level. As far as the infrastructure of energy supply, uh, as far as the uh, cross-border collaboration as far as the EU 27 and of course for a country like Finland that's it's obvious that that we understand that we need scalability we need economies of scope if and when we want to be strong economy in the world but absolutely as my colleague from Egypt said that we have to implement and I think it's it's everything it's about the implementation how we understand the system level approach it's even now in Europe that you really have to understand that how you do the electrification, digitalization, what's really meant by green transition and, and how you get people on board, how you include the local people. And then of course we look at the, the COP27 for instance or Glasgow that of course we as Europeans we really want to, to, to implement our solutions as well, not just you know pledging and providing money so my message here in the New York is that it's really time to, to understand the system level need of change as far as development cooperation, mm -hmm. as far as public-private partnerships. There's been a lot of talks during the last years. Says, yes, we're doing so much with this and this. But what the LDC countries, what, what the least developed countries really need, they need the solutions, as simple as that. And that's why I believe that today and tomorrow here in New York, it's so important that we are very solution driven, not just talking about money and pledges, because we have to be honest as well that the ODA is not enough. We all know that. Mm -hmm. But then again, we have to leverage the uh, private funding for adaptation. Now it's only 3%. We have to look at the mitigation that are we really holistic enough as far as the infrastructure and the digitalization, because as a Finn, I can, uh, I can truly say that if you want to be successful in green transition, you need the digitalization as well. In other words, you have to be very strategic, very holistic, and you need the local level acceptance, the, let's say, business to government approach that is really there with the trust. And we have a lot to do with uh, COP27, and hopefully we can get things better. No, thank you so much, uh, Minister. Um, Mr. Horsatter, we are uh, faced with a climate crisis, energy crisis, a food crisis, growing inflation, and a war, all happening at the same time. And um, we know that uh, crop uh, do play an important role in this. And uh, food prices have been soaring, has stabilized uh, a bit. But what are uh, the short and medium term 
strategies we need uh, for ensuring uh, also enhanced crop production in the years to come. Well, first, <coughs> thanks for inviting me here, uh, Bergen. Thanks for your leadership and, and what, what the forum is doing to convene and, and, and discuss and talk about solutions um, to this. And, and indeed, the, the food system is going through a rather extreme uh, situation at, at the moment after decades of uh, being able to grow more food for, uh, for a growing population. Uh, that changed a couple of um, years ago. Uh, and, um, and now, with the, as, as you mentioned, the, 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 the climate uh, uh, change with, with COVID that really uncovered how uh, fragile the, uh, the food system is. It's, it's really a very global system with very complicated supply chains uh, and, and much more vulnerable to disruption than what we uh, believed it to be before we were in the, in the middle of it like we are uh, right now. And then on top of it, uh, Russia's war on Ukraine, which is really impacting food production in, in Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is a food superpower. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, now with farmed land going, going down, ships being stuck in, in the harbor, that's uh, causing shortages uh, and, and increased prices as well. And, and, and then also the, the role of Russia in, in, the, in the food system, both as a producer of fertilizer and uh, of food, and, and, and then indirectly as a supplier of energy to, to Europe. Because why do we eat food in the first place? Well, it's to get energy. And when the energy prices go up, food prices go up as well. So it's, it's really connected. But what we're seeing in COVID and what we see as a result of the conflict I believe that this would have happened to the food system at some point anyway because of climate. And as we heard in the introductory uh, film here, no one is more vulnerable to climate change than the farmers. And we see this every day when we're working out, with the, out in the fields with the farmers, how they're impacted from weather. Look, at, look now in China with record drought, uh, in south of Europe as well, floods in Pakistan uh, and, and record high temperatures that we've seen this growing season in, in North America and in India. So it's, it's all b impacting the, the, the productivity. Um, and agriculture is part of the solution as well. 31% uh, of the greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture. So in that is the solution. So. Yeah, what do we do now short term? Uh, I, I think short term, the, the only thing we can do is to, to let's get product moving, uh, make safe corridors for food to get out of U Ukraine, uh, treat the fertilizers in a way so that it's not impacted by the conflict so it reaches the farmers, because if not, uh, crop yields will go down significantly. If you don't apply fertilizer, it could drop as much as 50% in the first season. So short term, we just need to get product flowing. Long term, or midterm, we need to change how we do farming, regenerative farming. I spent uh, the weekend together with uh, five farmers from in Brazil and the, and the U.S. this this weekend, and, and I see you know the impact possible if you do regenerative farming, looking after the soil, but still having the right productivity. So so it's it's doable, and as I heard from from the others in, in the panel as well, technology. Let's. Uh, Let's get this done and let's move from, uh, from pledges to, to, to really to action. We, we don't need any new innovations. We don't need any miracles in the food system. We have all the pieces. It's, it's about putting it in place and, and just doing it. I think many uh, of uh, the viewers probably um, reflect on the following. If the war continues in Ukraine and uh, we see uh, the global polarization also uh, continuing, are you afraid that there will, short and medium term, be a food crisis uh, in the world, see famine? Because we do see that some of the, for example, prices of wheat has gone down again uh, the last months. So short answer to that. Uh, we're in a, we're in a food crisis, uh, and, and I, I believe every uh, mother and father that cannot feed their uh, children now because of the increased uh, cost of uh, food, it is, a, it, is, it is a crisis. So how do we uh, lessen it? Yes, food prices have come down from the spike at the beginning, but a lot of that was uh, linked to um, uh, financial uh, transactions. And I was together with Sarah Menker uh, yesterday, and she explained it quite well on you know how much of that is financially driven, but the physical move of uh, uh, product uh, and, 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 and prices facing the end consumers, it's still very high. And, and 
yes, down from the uh, from the highs we saw in in winter, but still uh, significantly above uh, where we were a year ago and, and two years ago. And uh, I'm more worried about what happens now as we get into the next growing season, if we're not able to get the, the right amount of fertilizer out there and the yields uh, drop again and how that will impact the next harvest. So, so I, I think we have to still uh, treat this as a, as a food crisis and, and work accordingly. And you have to close some of your factories, don't you, because of uh, um, the energy prices in Europe? Yeah, n not only me, but, but the whole uh, nitrogen fertilizer industry in, in Europe uh, has been uh, significantly reduced in the last month. Uh, we're talking about 60 to 70 percent reduction in nitrogen fertilizer wow. production in, in Europe. And uh, that's an important uh, place to produce that product for, for the world uh, as well. And it's natural with the, with the kind of prices that we're seeing now for, uh, for, uh, for gas in, uh, in Europe. It's, it's been at an oil price equivalent to $500 per barrel of oil. And how can you produce any product at, uh, at that kind of uh, uh, cost? So, so um, yes, that's being curtailed and that has some, some real uh, severe con consequences. Thank you. Uh, back to you, Andrews, there. Uh, you already commented on uh, adaptation, but of course, uh, the basis for a more sustainable future is that we have to uh, mitigate CO2 emissions. And uh, we have to do a lot more faster. But we see all the complications. The European uh, energy crisis now, we are also seeing that some old uh, coal fire power plants are being uh, restarted in this uh, situation. But you've also been focusing at the Bessels Fund on environmental justice mm -hmm. related to uh, mitigation. So uh, where do you hope uh, things will go uh, in the coming years? Well, it would be very easy for us now, wouldn't it, to say, my goodness me, it's all so complicated. It's become so much more difficult and clearly we need to drill for more fossil fuels because uh, otherwise the economy will drive to a halt and so on. Um, look, uh, we need to use this current crisis as a, an additional spur to move quicker um, uh, so that we are no longer dependent upon you know, the fuel of the last century, but we're dependent rather uh, on the ingenuity and technology and clean and green of this, of this century. Um, so, so yes, you raise the issue of, of environmental justice, which uh, certainly to us at the Basos Earth Fund is very important, as I, I know it is to you, uh, Minister El Mashat, as well, uh, and hopefully to all of us, I think. <laughs> um, and there's two reasons why we need to focus on environmental justice. I mean, one is, as we said before, it is the poor and the disadvantaged and those that have tended to be on the margins of society that are the most effective. Uh, affected by the problem and so what we need to do is to um, provide resources to enable them to become um, more resilient um, and to adapt uh, but there's another reason uh, and that reason is that actually these same people are actually the source of the solution mm. and we tend to forget that um, the environmental movement the climate movement has tended to be sort of dominated by if you like more technocratic approaches um, and understandably, I mean, no one's been wicked about it. We've really, we've really tried to do our best. Plain fact of the matter, though, if we want to find solutions, give it to the people really on the front line, the people that actually can figure out the solutions. And by the way, this, this is not just an issue for developing countries. It's absolutely right here in the United States. The environmental movement has been dominated by more traditional, more technocratic, and quite frankly, more white-led organizations. Um, uh, the current administration in the United States is doing a remarkable job um, on something what they call Justice 40. So 40% of the hundreds of billions of dollars that are going to be put into green technology is to go to areas of disadvantage, uh, areas that um, have more black, brown, indigenous and people of color, um, which is a wonderful initiative. The problem is that actually even the federal government of the United States doesn't have the capacity to know exactly how to place that. They don't, because of the Constitution of the United States, the, the money flows down through the system, states have a role, not all states are on the same side, not all cities are on the same side. So, so what's the solution? Well, what we've done is put um, $300 million into the hands of um, uh, organizations run by indigenous people and, and people of color. And what's the point? The point is to build their capacity and also to build their ability to apply for that money and to pull the money in, if you like, 
So for example, if there's money for energy efficiency, traditionally, it's been wealthy areas that have had the right lawyers that can put in the right application forms and so on. So we have to flip that on its head. So it, it's just as relevant here in the United States as it is in, in countries around the world. And it's time that we, we, we've got to do something which takes us out of our comfort zone. Because mm -hmm. quite frankly, sending money to organizations that maybe not all of them have the capacity to have the sophisticated um, management structures that, that, that some more traditional organizations do. Fine, we need to b help them build that. Um, so so it's, it's, taking us, it's taking us out of our comfort zones and it's, it's, it's forcing us to actually take the risks that we absolutely must take. You know, it's, uh, I think that can be a very consequential approach. I remember when I was Secretary General of Red Cross, I think we spent too much time on filling out uh, applications yes. and then really doing uh, on the ground humanitarian um, work. But uh, of course, empowering um, new communities uh, is very important. But at the same time, we see the geopolitical situation is not that good. And global challenges need global solutions. And now we see that uh, the US and China even suspended their uh, discussions on climate. How, how, how can that uh, happen? And do you think that impasse will be broken in the coming weeks? Well, we certainly hope and pray that it will be, um, yeah. but we shouldn't wait for it. Um, we should work uh, in every way that we can to build bridges uh, to solve this uh, massive problem that humanity is facing. Um, and, and, uh, but at the same time, we need to get on with it. Um, and, and one of the exciting things, and the, the, those of you on the panel have been at the very frontiers of this, one of the most exciting things is that we, we've got a, a generation of leaders now that are saying, look, um, this must not stand. We are going to do things differently. You know, the world's most powerful fertilizer company are doing things quite differently. So, uh, uh, Tori, it's, uh, it's terrific. Um, uh, we, we're gonna see COP27 uh, do things differently. We're going to say, no, the existing structures won't, uh, won't do the job. Um, World Economic Forum is a different place today uh, than it was 10 years ago. You know, you put this right at the center. This is the very first event that you're putting on, I assume, in this very important week. And you put these issues of justice and climate at the very center of what you're doing. So there's a lot to be hopeful for. Um, but at the same time, w the battle is still not being won. Thank you, and uh, as also uh, Minister Skinnari uh, alluded to, I think the, uh, the private sector has to take also on mm. a more important role, uh, making sure that billions go to trillions when it comes to investing in climate mitigation and uh, adaptation and uh, justice. There is an area where we can also mobilize additional resources. And uh, thank you for the collaboration uh, that Egypt and the World Economic Forum is also uh, having in the run-up uh, to Sharm Sheikh. We will also do our best to mobilize also the private sector, but I think your approach is very much aligned with uh, what Mr. Sterrett just underlined, uh, more bottom-up uh, in empowerment of new groups. Just a few uh, uh, points to make, and, and I think uh, uh, everyone on the panel uh, is very much on agreement. So there's, there's a common denominator. And in order to move forward, we should not see climate as divorced from development. Climate issues are supposed to be embedded in the development plans of countries. This is a very, very key message, so that when you are financing climate, you are financing development. Uh, all of us know that there's a decade to uh, 2030 to the SDGs. We know that there is uh, shortcomings there. Nonetheless, uh, joining forces, climate and development as one goal, this is going to push us uh, very much into the future. Also, when we put climate with development, the locals uh, become part uh, of the discussion. When we talk about uh, agriculture, when we talk about adaptation, resilience comes up. And that is, as was mentioned, uh, we don't know what the next crisis is going to be and how it will affect food systems. That's why we need to invest in creating resilient systems uh, locally uh, across different countries and also in collaboration with one another. Um, the nexus of water, food, and energy is extremely important today. So when we're talking about uh, uh, agriculture, we have to talk about water. When we're talking about 
agriculture and water, how are we supposed to uh, bring the energy to that? So renewables become important. And that's why uh, Egypt, uh, as president of COP, but also as uh, one of the biggest countries in Africa, uh, we uh, created a program called the Nexus of Water, Food and Energy. Uh, it's NWFE. Uh, it's pronounced in Arabic, Nuwafi. Nuwafi means from pledges to implementation. Mm. So uh, this nexus of water, food, and energy, we've been able to mobilize our partners, uh, partners not just for finance, but also for technical uh, uh, as advisory. And this is a very, very important point that as you are pushing uh, the local communities, you also need to raise the capacity building to be able to access finance. The excuse is always that they are not ready. How are they supposed to fill in all these applications that you mentioned uh, uh, and so forth? So this, this NUEFI program, we had a very important uh, meeting in, in Cairo last week, uh, and we, had, um, uh, we launched Egypt's country platform for the NUEFI program, uh, and we have mobilized private sector, MDBs, the US, the GFANS, uh, and many of our uh, uh, partners, as well as the private sector, to be able to implement uh, these projects. And if this is successful, this would be a replicable example for other countries in Africa and elsewhere. So just to conclude, climate and development have to come hand in hand. We should no longer talk about climate by itself. I think this would be a way to motivate governments, private sector and local citizens to move forward. Uh, the second point is all of us need to be together. So they are all hands on deck, uh, be it the government with its regulatory uh, uh, you know, capacity, uh, the private sector telling us exactly what they need philanthropy coming in uh, into this uh, space in a very you know, forceful way. And that's why as part of the uh, COP27, we also put together the Sharm el-Sheikh guidebook for just financing. So it's also identifying what each stakeholder needs to do in order to move from pledges to implementation. Uh, and then finally, the word resilience uh, and uh, this concept of mitigation, adaptation, they shouldn't be, you, sh you shouldn't be choosing between them they actually should be uh, put hand in hand. So I'm not, when we say we, we invest more in adaptation, it's not that we are pulling away from mitigation resources, it's actually trying to increase the pie. Because when we take a look at uh, agriculture and water, energy becomes key. And if, uh, talking about Egypt, we are going to be uh, exporting more gas to Europe, uh, it means that we need to be producing more of our renewables. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is uh, part of this nexus of water, food and energy, part of the NUEFI program. As a huge solar potential yes. uh, in, solar in and Egypt, wind. Mm -hmm. solar yes. and wind. Uh, Mr. Skinare, I, I guess you want to comment on some of the things that have been uh, said. Uh, but as uh, Minister said, resilience is also core of this. And I know you've been very engaged in also early warning systems when it comes to natural disasters. That's, I guess, part of your adaptation strategy. Absolutely, and I hope we in Europe could find a similar word as, as you have for implementation. <coughs> I really have to improve my Arabic as well, but that's something to do as a homework. But maybe you have a Finnish word for it, huh? Well, I'm, I'm trying to find it, you know, Swedish or Norwegian. Yeah. Maybe it's coming up. <laughs> you need a, l a lot of <laughs> Sisu at least, huh? <laughs> at least. But to answer your question, yes, I think the uh, when we talk about, let's say, the implementation, as you said. What we really wanted to do some five years ago, as Finland, as our partner countries all over the world with the coalition of uh, finance ministers, this climate coalition, to really get the ministers of finance involved in order to be horizontal, in order to be holistic, but also to implement at the very national level, to the very local level. And I think now, having said all this, I really hope that this week, we can have altogether more than 100 countries on board on this coalition because then we can be more strategic and we can utilize that word that I cannot remember now what you just said. <laughs> oh, perfect. And, uh, but then I come to, to climate adaptation. Um, yes, we have been really working with the very least developed countries as far as the early warning system, saving lives with different technologies. But that's, I think that's a very good sample for public-private collaboration. Because we have many, many instruments. For companies, it's quite frustrating and time-consuming to really go back and forth. What is the instrument for this and that? But we really conceptualized early warnings with our National Meteorological Institute from Finland and with the private company called Vaisala 
which is of course uh, one of the leading technology providers. And then we scale it in within the African region as well as the, uh, let's say, the Americas as well. And that's something that we can say that yes, now the private money is leveraging. And that's why I have identified, let's say, three, four to five different thematic solutions from the mitigation to adaptation, but even to, to more, let's say, uh, more complex challenges in societies and, and to really provide that solution to the local level. And then after that, once we have the best technologies and the most important thing, the best people over there, the best team, then we start to think that where we get the money from, what kind of entities we need. And exactly what you said, that now we're too entity driven, we are too instrument driven, we are not solution driven. And then we're just asking ourselves that should we coordinate more? Yes, we should. But at the end of the day, we need, we need the solutions. And I think this is the topic for this week here in New York, that how we can really provide the solutions for the Africans, how we can build up the trust before COP27, how we can do it at the global level as far as development cooperation. And of course, what we have spoken a lot earlier on with you is that how we really get, let's say, from A to trade type of thinking as far as trade policy. And of course, as a trade minister, I really push now further the trade agreements within the African region, within well, between Europe and South America, Mercosur, for instance. We need those agreements if and when we want to be more sustainable in this world. And therefore, I really believe that, and I look forward to see you in Egypt. Yeah. Um. Thank you very much. Um, this afternoon we will even launch a new report showing the huge uh, potential when it comes to better facilitating uh, trade when it comes to green technology. Today uh, there are so uh, many obstacles if you want to export technology that is also uh, going to be crucial when it comes to green uh, investing. So. Um, but uh, as you heard, uh, Sventura, um, there uh, is a lot of need for additional capital. There is a lot of uh, green energy projects out there, and uh, there is a lot of money sitting on the sideline. I think like a trillion US dollars uh, from the private sector that can be invested. And what, uh, what does it take to get those money invested uh, into those projects because uh, if you have the projects and you have the money and nothing happens we, we are not making progress yeah I mean, we need to, to accelerate that and I, I believe we're at that point now where um, the understanding of the, of the issue and, and, the, and the need to work to, together is uh, it's so urgent now and understood that, that uh, it, it's about uh, moving to the implementation uh, phase and, and and I fully agree what you said on uh, you know climate and development goes hand in hand uh, and in order to, to get that done at scale, then we need the private sector to play a role, but not alone. It needs to be done in, in cooperation. And I'm really uh, pleased with, uh, with, with the agenda for COP27. I'm also uh, happy that there will be a food pavilion. We will be there from the private sector as well to, to work together. Uh, and in agriculture, you know, climate and development, it, it plays such a huge role in creating that resilience to make a more uh, resistant agriculture to climate change. We see it when, when the farmers get the tools and the knowledge uh, and, and focus on soil health, it's much more resistant to climate change. You have less soil erosion. When you have floods, it, it keeps more of the nutrients in, in the ground. The, the crops grow better even in, in drought as, as well. But then we need to, to use technology, to, to, to work together with um, organizations like uh, like the Bezos Earth Fund and with, with Andrew here to, you know, how can we, we, we use uh, technology to, to drive change? Let's do soil mapping globally, uh, because if you if, if you know the soil conditions, then the first of all, the, you can do something about it. You can create a more healthy uh, soil. You will get better yields. I was in uh, Africa two weeks ago in Kigali and when I see the impact to farmers, when you when you help them to put the right nutrition in the ground, focusing on the soil health, we're not talking small changes to yields. We're talking 50 percent increases or doubling wow. in, in the first harvest. And maybe this could be the wake up call needed in order to really accelerate African agriculture as well. Uh, the continent imports food for 50 billion dollars a year. 
money that should stay in Africa and develop uh, African um, uh, workplaces and, and creating food security. And we see the need to have more local food production as well now. So, so, so um, if we could work together, um, come up with solutions, but focus on now implementing because we, we really know what we need to do. It's about uh, getting it done and trust is also an important part of the equation here. And, and uh, unfortunately, t uh, unfortunately, right now, I feel trust is short in supply, but let's, uh, <laughs> let's uh, at least uh, get started with some things and, and, and demonstrate what is possible. So, uh, Andrew Ster, I, I guess this was uh, good music in your ears, but uh, moving into implementation, we've been talking about that uh, for decades, and the crisis is really here. I, I think the planet is really on fire, but uh, the geopolitical, economic situation are no excuses not for uh, really delivering on it. But uh, what does it take of new ways of doing things uh, to really make progress? Because as I said in the beginning, I think the price of inaction far exceeds the price of action. But that's hard to get that internalized uh, to some leaders. Yeah. Well, I, I think it needs at least two big things. First, it needs uh, a change in mindset. Uh, many uh, policymakers, many CEOs still uh, believe the economics of the last century, which basically said, be nice to act, but actually it's going to cost us. We're going to lose jobs, we're going to lose growth, we're going to lose competitiveness. Uh, the economics of this century <laughs> have demonstrated that smart, bold action on climate change will lead to more economic efficiency, will drive new technologies, will lower risks, and will reshape expectations about the future. Those four things combined actually lead to a dynamism that most economic models still don't capture. So first we need that, um, that intellectual revolution to uh, enter our minds <laughs> so that we have a different perspective. The second thing is um, exactly as uh, you've all been saying, but you, you made the point very, very clear, uh, Sventori, which is we need creative um, collective action partnerships um, there are no silver bullets, uh, it's a jigsaw puzzle. And it's a jigsaw puzzle in several senses. Uh, one is that we need different types of actors to come together. Um, and so we now need, whether it's philanthropy, whether it's government, um, uh, to work with the private sector, to work with uh, NGOs and so on in a, a creative way that we've not done before. So for example, we've just together with the Rockefeller Foundation and the IKEA Foundation, uh, we've created something called the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet, and we work very closely with your, your team on this. And what's the point? Well, the point is if you could get a couple of billion dollars of grant money that you can deploy very quickly, you can then sort of operate at three levels. First, on the, the politics and policies and plans. Second, pipeline development. And third, de-risking. And in each of those, we need relationships with governments, with civil society, with corporations in a sort of creative way. And then we need to bring in the more traditional but very good financial institutions, the World Banks, the African Banks, and so on, in a way that we can actually do things a little bit differently. Um, and we can have a capital stock where actually those that can afford to take risks, those that can afford to move quickly, can get in there and encourage the others. Well, thank you uh, very much. Um, I think this has been uh, a very good start of our meeting that is going on uh, the whole week. And uh, the road uh, to Sharm Sheikh and COP27 uh, in Egypt, of course, there are a lot of challenges, but I feel that this group also shared with us uh, some silver linings. Uh, as uh, Andrew Stairs just said, uh, this energy transition, the green transition, can create jobs and can create a different planet uh, in the years to come. And the application of the new technologies, but also looking at this crisis as an opportunity. Look at 1973, at the oil uh, crisis back then. That led to a big change in our, our economy. Cars were then back running with 1.8 liter uh, per 10 kilometers. After a few years, it was uh, uh, a liter per uh, 10 kilometers. Today, 17% of the cars sold this year are electric cars. And in the years to come, there will be even more. 
after the oil crisis in 73, uh, we saw the introduction of new uh, nuclear plants, different uh, ways of facing out coal in railways and in ships and etc. So maybe this uh, deglobalization of energy uh, is also something that will increase the energy security because you will have solar panels, windmills at the different countries. So you also increase your energy security. So decoupling economic growth from growth in CO2 uh, is something uh, that we are looking at and the World Economic Forum also are proud that we mobilize our partners uh, in uh, no, an implementation mood in the run-up to uh, COP27. So thank you very much uh, for joining us uh, today. Early morning here uh, in New York, but that's the way to get things done. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well done. Thank you.